Welcome back everyone to the channel for another retro GPU breakdown where today we're going to uncover the Nintendo DS and break down how its fascinating graphics subsystem made all the 3D graphics on the console work. This was a highly requested video for a while now so I'm really happy to finally bring this to you. Diving into the Nintendo DS was certainly a fun experience which didn't quite have a GPU but instead had a hybrid graphics architecture built for the Nintendo DS called its 3D engine. But as always before we begin subscribe if you enjoy these tech breakdown videos you want to catch my weekly uploads and if you enjoyed this video make sure to like it so that way youtube will pick up on that and share it to other people who may enjoy it as well blah 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 all the intro stuff now let's just skip formality and get right into the sauce by breaking down the overall specs of the ds before we dive into the gpu and what made it tick its main cpu was an arm 9 46e-s chip which i'm going to designate just arm 9 from here forward that operated at 67 megahertz it was used for game logic and also the video rendering it had a secondary cpu as well which was an arm 7 pdmi which i'm going to just refer as the arm 7 from here forward at 33 megahertz which was basically the game boy advanced cpu but at twice the clock speed and was responsible for background sound calls the networking on the system and also around the backwards compatibility when playing game boy advanced games the memory configuration of the ds is extremely interesting but its main ram allocations are its four megabytes of pseudo static random access memory or ps ram and its dedicated video Video memory which was 656 kilobytes used specifically by the 3d and 2d engines the RAM configuration also gets a little more interesting from there but we will cover that later in this video its graphics were powered by the aforementioned 3d engine which had control over one of the two DS screens at a time and was backed up by two dedicated 2d engines again one available per screen but simultaneously and already you might be wondering, this GPU kind of sounds a bit different than what we've talked about in the past when it comes to GPUs on this channel, and it doesn't seem like a specific GPU or SIMMED graphics processing unit. And that's where the DS actually gets really interesting. You see, the Nintendo DS does not have a traditional GPU like you'd imagine. Instead, it has a custom-designed graphics system integrated into the DS's NTR SoC, or Nitro SoC. This 3D engine is the heart of the graphics for the Nintendo DS and contains a geometry engine and a rendering engine within it. Now this configuration lacks the ability of programmable shaders, but it does use hardwired logic to handle basic and effective 3D pipelines. For example, the geometry engine is able to still perform vertex transformations, polygon sorting, lighting, and clipping, and the rendering engine is still able to perform texture mapping with active perspective correction, alpha blending, depth buffering, depth fog, shadowing, cell or tune shading, and even anti-aliasing as well. Now since the 3D engine worked hand in hand with the ARM 9 CPU to render the graphics, it mimicked the same 67 megahertz clock speed of the CPU. Now since the Nintendo DS's 3D engine was integrated with the ARM 9 processor to render its graphics, it shared the same 67 megahertz clock speed. Overall, the 3D engine made the DS capable of up to 2048 triangles per frame, 6144 vertices per frame, and had a pixel fill rate of 7.2 million pixels per second with a texel fill rate of 4.8 million texels per second, although these numbers were often bottlenecked further by alpha blending. It also supported 1024 by 1024 textures, but 128 by 128 or 256 by 256 were much more common due to the limited VRAM in the DS. We are talking about just over half a megabyte after all. The two 2D engines I mentioned earlier also were featured in the DS and were designated Engine A and Engine B. Each 2D engine is assigned to one of the two DS's screens at a time and the developer choose which goes where, just like it does for the 3D engine. There is a catch though and I'll explain that more in a little bit. These basically are the same 2D engines from the single 2D engine found in the predecessor of the Nintendo DS, the Game Boy Advance, but Engine A is a beefier and more advanced version and is called the Main Engine due to several enhancements that set it apart from Engine B. For example, Engine A supports extended background modes, which allow for bitmap rendering, great for effects or drawing images directly. It also offers better affine transformations like rotating or scaling and shearing across up to four different background layers. Now, like I mentioned earlier, the developers are allowed to choose which screen either of the 2D engines are able to occupy. However, the catch I mentioned a second ago is Engine A is the only one connected to the DSS3. 
3D engine. This means that if a game combines 3D and 2D elements, like simply placing a UI over the top of a 3D screen, it has to use Engine A to do so and take advantage of its advancements that Engine B is not capable of. Here's an idea of how that works. The 3D engine renders the scene into a frame buffer stored in RAM. That frame buffer is then passed through Engine A, which composites any additional 2D layers like sprites, HUDs, or even backgrounds on top using a tile-based rasterizer with per scanline processing. This tile-based rendering also works perfectly with the DS as it means lower memory usage, easier per scanline effects, and efficient for rendering at the 256 by 192 resolution the two DS screens had. But the 3D engine alongside 2D Engine A is how Nintendo was able to do a lot of the tricks that they did in a lot of their 3D titles and work together using the strengths of both combined to bring us the type of graphics technology we saw in the early 2000s on this type of handheld. Of course, if a game didn't use 3D at all, 2D Engine A was capable of rendering better, of course, 2D effects than 2D Engine B. But at the end of the day, 2D Engine B was often mostly used just for the backwards compatibility aspect, as that 2D engine would also run alongside the ARM 7 CPU when using backwards compatibility mode for Game Boy Advance games. Now, of course, as promised, and to get a real idea of the performance of the DS as a whole, especially the graphics performance, we have to dive deep into the memory configuration of of the console and this is where things get a lot more interesting than I'm used to. You see overall the DS had eight different memory configurations to work with. The first and the largest was the aforementioned four megabytes of the pseudo static RAM. This PSR RAM ran at 33 megahertz and was operating on a 16-bit memory bus shared between both the ARM 9 and ARM 7 CPUs. This RAM acted as general purpose memory for everything from game logic to audio buffers and could not be used at all with the 3D or 2D engines for graphics. For this purpose, there was a second allocation that I also mentioned earlier that was the 3D engines dedicated 656 kilobytes of VRAM, which also operated at the same 33 megahertz as the PS RAM, but due to its direct integration into the 3D engine, allows for much faster access for rendering. This VR RAM allocation was split into nine separate banks. These banks were labeled A through I. These banks were dynamically mappable and could be assigned as anything from a 3D buffer, texture memory block, background tiles for the 2D engine, or even a direct display output. Developed Developers could reconfigure the banks on the fly for different scenes depending on what was needed, but this also of course demanded careful memory management and more optimization. A typical setup might look something like this, where banks A and B hold the 3D frame buffer, like I mentioned earlier, with the 3D engine and 2D engine A, and are a combined 256 kilobytes in size, with 128 kilobytes each. Bank C being dedicated to 3D texture data with its 128 kilobyte size, bank D used for 2D background tiles or extended palettes also at 128 kilobytes in size, and banks E through I shuffled around for UI layers, off-screen buffers, or even just dual screen management, and would be comprised of one 64 kilobyte bank and one 32 kilobyte bank with three much smaller 16 kilobyte banks. This configuration allowed developers an easy way of sorting how they wanted the RAM to be used and for what purpose, but as you can imagine, left restrictions if more was needed in certain areas. The third allocation was two kilobytes of object attribute memory, or OAM. One kilobyte was dedicated per screen of the DS, and the OAM stored sprite definitions like position, size, and rotation. It didn't store sprites themselves, but rather held the instructions for how to draw them. The limited size only allowed for about 128 sprites on the screen per screen, regardless of size. The fourth allocation consists of a kilobyte of palette RAM, 512 bytes per screen, allowing for 256 color palettes in 15-bit RGB. Since sprites and backgrounds do not store colors directly, their pixel data were just indexes to be used by the palette RAM working closely with the dedicated video memory to resolve final colors after the VRAM got the tile graphics like we talked about before. Admittedly, this is a very small allocation split between the two screens, so reuse of color palettes was very common and also kind of critical. The fifth and the sixth allocations were 104 kilobytes of polygon RAM and 144 kilobytes of vertex RAM, both working closely with the geometry engine and the rendering engine I mentioned at the beginning of this video, which are two critical components inside the 3D engine that help 
help the DS render its 3D graphics. The polygon RAM specifically held geometry commands like draw triangles, as well as matrix operations, and did texture assignments and lighting info. The vertex RAM stored actual vertex data, like X and Y or Z positions, as well as texture chords and normals. All in all, this left the DS with a total of just shy of 5 megabytes of RAM between all these different configurations that I mentioned, and was absolutely the most interesting RAM setup I have researched in any video so far. It actually gets really in-depth, and this video would be extremely long if I broke it down piece by piece. And I actually can't help but notice a trend here with how much thought went into older handhelds to provide the results that they did, although primitive today, especially the DS in this example. And the farther back I go in this timeline here for these videos, the more I'm starting to see this, where really complex solutions were designed and created to just play video games. Whereas today, they do things a lot more simplified and are a lot more akin to basic computers. But back in the day, they prioritized dedicated circuits with predictable memory access for these separate components. Times have certainly changed, that is for sure. But that is all I have in today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and found this information interesting. I definitely did. If you have any favorite memories with the DS, please comment down below and share with us all. Finally, if you are a part of my dedicated ramble squad and you sat here and listened to me ramble, please let me know that you watched the entire video below so I can personally thank you in the comments. Anyway, I'll stop with all that. That's all I have for you now. And I hope you have a great morning, day, or evening, and I'll see you in next week's video. Peace.